Thanks for joining us today on The Loins of History. My name is Jay, and I'm joined by my co-host, Colin. Uh, Today, we're going to be talking about the question of why did the Russian Federation invade Ukraine? What's their causus belli? And answering the question, are there any Nazis in the Ukraine. So this is part three of our uh, series on the current Russia-Ukraine conflict. And a lot has happened since we started recording. So I'm just going to give a, uh, a quick update on the, the situation. So Russia invaded the Ukraine again in, on February 23rd of this year, 2022. That invasion had uh, about three main axes of advance. So in in 2014, uh, the Russians already occupied Crimea and about half portions of what's called the the Donbass, which are centered around two major Ukrainian cities uh, called uh, Luhansk and Donetsk. And... That's kind of where we started. So the three main axes of advance, there was a there was a major push from Crimea, so from the south up towards the north. There was a major push just slightly north of the Donbass to try to cut off the the Ukrainian armed forces that were in the Donbass, and then there was a major northern axis of advance towards Kiev. Where we're at today is the the northern axis towards Kiev has completely and utterly failed. They never got Kiev. They did get close, uh, but a lot of Russians died. And they basic, and that was through Belarus, by the way, uh, through the, um, the Chernobyl exclusion zone where the nuclear power plant uh, had that meltdown. A lot of Russians died, and they, basic, they basically were like, hey, not working out anymore. The southern advance th- from up from the Crimea was initially very successful. They've got they've gained a lot of territory down there. However, they've kind of hit the pause button, uh, and now the vast majority of the fighting is taking place in the Donbass still. Mm-hmm. So uh, recently, they've uh, taken a few key cities there, and. But the Ukrainians have successfully repelled them from the the second largest city in the Ukraine, Kharkiv, which is a Russian-speaking uh, city. The Russians were not able to take that city. So the fighting is in between Kharkiv and uh, northern, uh, northern Donbass. Uh, there's been some allegations of atrocities and human rights violations on both sides. Uh, you know, here in the West, we see Bukha is probably the big one where there's mass graves and, you know, people being buried with their hands tied behind their back type deal. But there's also allegations against the Ukrainians conducting torture, committing extrajudicial killings, things like that. So that's kind of the update of the current situation on the ground. What what I would like to do uh, and discuss with you, Colin, today on the loins of history. <laughs> How did we get here? Uh, and I found an article. Now, this article was written uh, in on the 4th of April of this mm-hmm. year. So it's a little dated, which is one reason why we wanted to give the, the update. But this article was written by a gentleman named Timofey Sergeyev. Forgive me, I'm I'm not a Russian speaker, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, Mr. Sergeyev uh, wrote an article uh, titled "What Russia Should Do with the Ukraine," and he published it in an outlet called RIA Novosti, which is a Russian-owned news agency. So, unlike here in the United States, uh, where you know the government and other actors can influence the press, we don't own the press. Legally speaking, here in the United States, we still have a free press. <laughs> Russia, is that is not the case. And RIA Novosti is a state-owned uh, Russian news agency. So this article was, like, approved by the Russian government. And I think it's a very good look into 
how the Russian government in particular views the current conflict. So without further ado, I'm just going to read uh, a couple snippets just so our readers have an idea of what we're of what we're going to discuss. So start with the beginning of the article. Already in April of last year, we wrote about the inevitability of the denazification of Ukraine. We do not need a Nazi banderite Ukraine, an enemy to Russia, and an instrument of the West for the destruction of Russia. Today, the matter of denazification has come into the practical plane. Denazification is necessary when a significant part of the people, most likely the majority of it, have been mastered by the Nazi regime and drawn into its politics. That is to say, when the hypothesis that the people are good, the government is bad, does not work. Recognition of this fact is the foundation of the policy of denazification of all its measures, while the fact itself is the subject matter. So that's kind of the, the, the first introductory uh, paragraph to, to what we're going to discuss. So point one that we'll discuss here in a second is uh, why, why Russia believes the Ukraine is a bunch of Nazis. So Colin, what, what do you think about of that first paragraph? Like is, are there actually, is, is, is the Ukrainian a bunch of Nazis or is, is something off here? So I think there is some validity to the claim that there's Nazis there. I mean, there's the the Azov regiment there, so that's you know roughly a thousand to two thousand um, Ukrainians who have ties to you know this kind of neo-Nazi identity. But you know when they claim that there's this Nazification, if you read the article, they make it seem it's not just a, a regiment of Ukrainians that are you know have neo-Nazi ties. It is the entire state of Ukraine, everything from the leadership all the way down to these foot soldiers. So I think the claim is overblown. They are taking a small truth that there are some neo-Nazis in Ukraine, and they are using that, I think, as a ploy and as an excuse to invade Ukraine. Um, I think it is a calculated decision. Um, you know, the word Nazi obviously has such powerful connotations when you say the word. Um, obviously, everyone would consider them the Nazis bad. So I think Putin is saying, okay, if there's Nazis there, it, it only makes sense for me to attack it and invade because that's a bad thing. Obviously, Russia has a history of um, fighting the Nazis. You know, throughout the article, they invoke um you know, the history of Russia attacking or defending themselves against the Nazis, destroying the Nazi powers. Um, so they very much um, are clinging to this idea and this excuse and proclaiming it as their reason for invading. That being said, I think it is overblown. Um, I think there's a lot more to this invasion. I think it harkens back to the identity, uh, you know, this identity politics and Russians seeing them, um, Ukrainians as fellow Russians um, in the article. They actually call a lot of these Russian cities, these cities in Ukraine, they call them Russian cities. So I think they really see them as fellow Russians to the south, and they just want to destroy the identity of Ukraine. And they're just using the word Nazi as an excuse. I don't know. That That's yeah. my thoughts there. What do you think? Yeah, no, I, I'm definitely in the same position. The It is a... It would be unfair to call it a convenient talking point because, like you said, there is validity to the statement that there's Nazis in the Ukraine. The you you mentioned there's these nationalist battalions. Uh, just I wanted to talk about a little bit about Stefan Bandera because mm -hmm. when I, when I first read this article, I was like, "What are Banderites?" Like I have no idea. <laughs> and Bandera is an interesting dude because. In the, in the grand scheme of things, he didn't really do that much, but mm -hmm. he, uh, so before World War II, uh, after World War I, the Poles, uh, the, the Polish government controlled uh, really the Western portion of what is now Ukraine with the major city being Lviv, 
uh, Lviv's been big in the news, but Lviv used to belong to Poland and that whole area. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's where, that's where Stefan Bandera was born, raised. And the, that area is a, is a big ethnic mix of, uh, Ukrainians, Hungarians, Poles, Russians, Romanians, like it's a, it's very much a big, a big mix there. And Bandra was a Ukrainian nationalist and he was part of an organization called the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, the OUN, <laughs> which split uh, after mm-hmm. World War One into a, uh, a, moderate moderate relative to other nationalists <laughs> faction and a and a relative uh, very, and a radical very faction term. yeah like they're still they're still like hyper nationalists in an age of which like fascism's on the rise by the way mm-hmm. uh, this was before fascism wasn't cool anymore so uh and he led the radical faction and interestingly enough his his main enemy was the poles cuz that's Polish government controlled that area. So they like tried to assassinate uh, a Polish government official and which failed and they put him in prison. Well, fast forward, the Nazis world war two invade uh, and take over obviously significant parts of the Ukraine. Well, when Russia starts beating them back Germany starts getting desperate and they go, Hey, we've got this dude in prison. Maybe he can help us. Cause he's a Ukrainian nationalist. So they, they release him and he starts fighting with the attempt to fight in the Soviet union. But when they release him, Bandra has no like loyalties to Nazis. Mm-hmm. And that's one reason why this is confusing because yes, Bandra was an ultra nationalist and his followers have neo-Nazi intentions and are very pro Nazi Germany. But Bandera himself actually ended up plotting against the Nazis and the Soviets because he was a Ukrainian nationalist. I'm not trying to mm-hmm. defend the guy. I'm just trying to explain the full context of like, it's odd it, in our in my Western American opinion that, you know, the current term of Banderites would be applied when, yes, a lot of the Ukrainians do lift this guy up, but like he was eventually rejailed and then executed by the Germans, <laughs> not the Russians, so, the Germans. It, it, it's funny. So, you know, when we, we hear them say the term Nazi, we think, you know, goose stepping Germans, but in reality, it's that they're these ultra nationalist Ukrainians who have Nazi ties. So we, we're seeing, Ger- we're thinking Germans, but in reality, like you said, it is, a pro-Ukrainian identity, which I think is important. And they, you know, you read the article and you take a look around and you see that um, Putin and the Russians are equating um, Ukrainian identity and what it is to you being a Ukrainian as a Nazi. So there's there's a really key sentence in there that he says, um, the practice of Nazism should be liquidated and banned Although, as well as the leadership, a significant part of the masses, the masses, so the people who are passive Nazi, Nazis, accomplices of Nazis, is also guilty. So I think that's really key there. So he's basically saying anybody, you know, to translate that, he's saying if anybody um, supports being an independent Ukrainian, um, you're guilty. And then he, they basically go on to talk about um, that's going to be destroyed. And you're going to be sent to re re-education camps, um, and they talk about the culture and education. So we go back to identity. So the Russians want to reestablish a um, Russian identity in Ukraine, not a Ukrainian identity. So there's a really big conflict, I think, when it comes to culture and identity there as well. Which is, you know we talked about last week as the Russians see the Ukrainians as wayward brothers. Yeah, I mean, and and it's also yes, they want to establish a Russian identity, but like they're using these claims of uh, Nazism, and they're connecting that to the idea of Ukraine writ large. Like there is yeah, no, exactly. there's no such thing as Ukraine, and it's it's kind of a skillful manipulation of the truth because 
when Vladimir Putin talks about like Ukraine's a fake country, it doesn't really think it's not really a thing. Like, yes, at pre World War Two, the only historical precedent for a country of the Ukraine existing is is the semi autonomy that the Cossacks used to have. Um, and even then, like, it wasn't like, it didn't look anything like it used, it looks like today. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is like, there is a distinct ethnic, linguistic, cultural difference between the Slavic peoples that live in the steppe in the Kievian forests, uh, especially in Crimea itself, mm -hmm. than the Muscovites that spread out of Moscow. Like they're all Slavic. They're all, they have these connections, but they're not, it's not the same. So, you know, we talked about that. Do you think that Putin and the Russians saw Ukraine, you know, obviously there's a fork in where their cultures and where their identities were going. Do you think that he thought, okay, it's been about 30 years since the, the fall of the Soviet Union. Now is the time that we need to invade and reign Ukraine in if we want to maintain a Russia, a single Russian identity before it's too late. And that's why he, he said, okay, we've got to go now and invade. I, I don't know. And there's, I think there's a lot of things going on in the mind mm -hmm. of Vladimir Putin. And, you know, I will, I will repeat the same, you know, the same disclaimer that a lot of, a lot of folks on TV were saying, like, no one can know what's in the mind of Vladimir Putin, <laughs> but I do, I think this has less to do with, oh, Vladimir Putin, uh, wants to unite the Russian peoples and more to do with the dude, you know, there's, we have very good reasons to believe this dude's dying right now. And when he took over the country in, in 2000, mm -hmm. there was like a big tranche of people joining NATO. So it was like day one in the office, so to speak, his country's sphere of influence was eroding. This is, it has always been at the top of his list to try to reclaim either the territorial uh, boundaries or at least like the sphere of influence that mm -hmm. the Russian Empire slash Soviet Union used to have. I think this has more to do with Putin's ego than it does with legitimate security concerns. Yeah, I mean, you think about when he was in the KGB, you know, coming up and he was never like a you know, hardcore spy, like you see from James Bond or the man from uncle or something like that. He, he was mostly a paper pusher throughout yeah. his career, but he was in, you know, the KGB still during is. the Soviet empire. It, it still is. It's just a, a Neo KGB. Um, so, yeah. you know, that was what he grew up in experience seeing the Soviet union as, you know, the power it was Soviet union in the U S and that's what he grew up and that's what he saw. And then you think in really a matter of months, it just evaporated and suddenly, um, Russia was no longer, I think at one point during the beginning of his presidency or his basically dictatorship, you know, they had a, a smaller GDP than Portugal. So they really fell hard. Yep. So yeah, oh, that's yeah. a great point. He, the, he definitely, I mean, it's, the, it's a, it's a very similar situation to Adolf Hitler. And mm -hmm. to be clear about the distinction here, like there's, there's huge differences between Vladimir Putin and Adolf Hitler. Right. But one of the similarities is their national context. The, you know, the Weimar Republic was not a play, good place to grow up in. Like it was embarrassing. It was horrific. Like people are poor. The economic situation was awful. And, and a strong nationalist, a strong personality shows up and goes, I'm going to make life better for normal people. Like Vladimir Putin walked into the exact well, into a very, very similar context where, like to your point, the Russian economy was in shambles uh, mm -hmm. and he has been trying to, quote unquote, make Russia great again. <laughs> uh, but like you don't you don't stay in power and have people kiss your butt for 22 years and remain a humble dude. 
Like, mm. you know, that would be that would literally be anybody. This is why we have democratic elections and why people uh, rotate out. Oh wait, not some congressmen and women, but at yeah, least the president that's, that's rotates a topic out. For another series. That's a topic for another series. <laughs> yeah, another series. Yeah. But like, it's just human nature, man. Like, look at Xi Jinping. Like, Xi Jinping is not becoming more liberal. He's becoming more dictatorial and autocratic. Like, uh, it's human nature. You can definitely tell that he has, you know, he's in bad health. I think that is either a a stress from the conflict and really the weight of finding the world in a way, you know, economically and basically cutting Russia off from the rest of the world with this conflict. That's, that is a lot of stress. So he probably has had some sort of heart condition stroke. I'm sure he had something or it was an assassination attempt, whether it was by Ukrainian, some other um, state actors or these oligarchs who he's displaced, who they liked the nineties in that Yeltsin era. And when Russia was in shambles, because they became very wealthy and influential. And now, especially over the past four or five months have lost all of their influence um, internationally and within Russia. So they may have had something to do with some sort of plot on um, Putin's life. Cause if you look at him, he, I think some of the, you know, it was a couple weeks ago, they published some photos of him and he was, very, he looked bad. I mean, he was swollen. You could definitely tell he was on yeah. some sort of steroid. Um, and he was just acting very, um, you know, normally he's pretty stoic and, you know, he has a very strong presence. You could just tell he wasn't there. Um, so something happened and, you know, it wasn't necessarily successful, but they came close. Something came close. Yeah. I mean, again, the Adolf Hitler parallels are huge. Like in, in 1938, when Neville Chamberlain met with Hitler over and over again, uh, I think three times total, he walked away from that thinking Hitler's a good dude. Uh, you know, we can trust him. Everything's fine. We didn't know until years later, not only Hitler was not just a, not a good dude, but crazy wicked. Uh, his health was really bad. The stress mm -hmm. of uh, trying to pull his country out of the abyss um, of the 20s and 30s was killing him, you know? And I don't, that doesn't evoke any pity for from me <laughs> or, or towards Hitler or Putin. But like, again, it's these... And how many how many assassination attempts were on Hitler? Like several. You know, the Valkyrie plot is uh, the most most common one. But a dude tried to kill him. There was like some anniversary in the beer hall that the beer hall putsch was done. Mm -hmm. Dude tried putting a bomb in the in the wall and it didn't work. Like there were multiple assassination attempts. And I would like our listeners to recall that I made the prediction uh, in a previous episode <laughs> that there would be a coup. Which I said was a hail mary, but thank you, Colin, for <laughs> you know what I, I can't for, I can't call it a coup though. Playing in a, I would say an assassination attempt is still not quite a coup. The only difference being, you know, and sure. that's a good point. But it's a, I, I, I think the West has assumed that there would be, you know, based on these economic sanctions being cut off from the rest of the world. They, I think we thought that, oh, surely they're not going to take this. I think a coup has to requ require some sort of organization at an organizational level. They have a plan, not just to assassinate the leader and, and cut the head off, but they have to have mm -hmm. some sort of replacement at many levels of government, um, you know, top to bottom, really, and to replace the current government with a new one, not just, not just kill them. Because if you kill Putin, that's just going to create some massive chaos across Russia. So I, I can't quite call it a coup, but you can say somebody was really pissed off and, and tried to do something yeah. um, that I'm sure that somebody's going to disappear for. Um, so I, yeah. I can't quite call it a coup well, though, but. I don't know if you saw, but they moved Nalvani uh, from wherever he was before. I saw Anthony Blinken, the secretary of state tweeted mm -hmm. this on uh uh, calling on the Russian government because apparently they didn't notify his family nor his lawyer that they were moving him. 
And I thought to myself, like, oh, no, he's escaped. And they're just covering by saying, like, oh, we moved him. But in reality, they're like, where's he at? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do not know, but it's freaking Russia. They lie their faces off. So yeah, exactly. All right. Yeah. So we're going to we're going to push on to the second main point here, and that is. Hey, it's all it's 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 one thing to accuse a country of being a bunch of Nazis, but it's a it's another thing to put uh I think the high number back in February was like 150, 175,000 troops on a country's border and try to invade them mm-hmm. because you disagree with the politics of that country, <laughs> right? Uh <clears throat> uh so why? So the question here is, why is Russia choosing to respond with a quote unquote special military operation? So a quick a quick paragraph again from our from our Sergei Sev uh, article. Uh, Although everything listed above does not make Ukrainian Nazism a light version of German Nazism from the first half of the 20th century. On the contrary, since Ukrainian Nazism is free from such genre-specific framework and restrictions, real quick, what he means there is that Ukrainian Nazism doesn't have to be exactly like Hitler Nazism. It's free from those constraints and can be its own version of Nazi. Mm -hmm. Uh, Since it's free from such genre-specific framework and restrictions, it freely unfolds as the fundamental basis of all forms of Nazism, like the European, and in its most developed form, American racism. This is why denazification cannot be conducted with compromises on the basis of formulas such as no to NATO, yes to the EU. The collective West is itself the designer, source, and sponsor of Ukrainian Nazism, while the Western Ukrainian Banderite cadres in their historical memory are but one of the tools for the Nazification of Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine, Ukro-Nazism carries not a lesser, but a greater threat to the world and to Russia than Hitler's version of German Nazism. Okay, he used a lot of lot of lot of key words there that I think are, are hot button issues today. And again, <laughs> I think it goes back to to okay, we're gonna we're gonna use this word to justify it. But he's basically saying because he goes on to say that um, there is no Ukraine like the, it, as an idea. It, it, it's not it's incompatible. So I think he's just using Nazism with Ukrainian. So and they're just they're just it's they're synonymous, and he's just using Nazi because. It is more of a hot button issue, but he really means like you're not going to be a Ukrainian, and that's not good for Russia. And he right. goes on to say that um, it's inevitable um, de-Europeanization. Yes, yes. Well, so we're actually going to get to that. That's oh, literally the paragraph that I'm going to read on point three. So I'll read it. In a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but he does he does talk about that in this paragraph. Um, yeah, the the connection between. Uh, What's the there's a there's a word in philosophy like A equals B equals C. Like what he's done is A, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis are equal to B, the current Ukrainian government, which cannot be distinguished from C, all the U, like Ukrainianism writ large. It's it, it's ethno linguistic characteristics. Which is that's mind blowing, man. Like the when I read that, it was like, holy crap, the like this dude is literally advocating to eradicate a people group, like a uh an identity that they've just willy well, I don't say willy nilly, but that they've successfully manipulated to be equivalent to uh Nazism. By the way, that term's called transitive law. Just for the listeners out there, the A Thank equals you. B equals C. So Thank very good. Colin, you deep, you, deep, you deep philosopher, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah they, no, go ahead. No, I, you know, I just can't get over this idea that 
they just see you and you know it's almost like they see the idea of being ukrainian as evil you know just like we see the term nazi as evil they see ukrainian it is a threat to them it is evil and they are going to destroy it you know it's funny he even threw in american racism because they knew that okay you know maybe if we can peel off a little bit of american support just a little bit you know if you think you get five to ten percent of americans to suddenly not be involved five to ten percent in American politics is a lot of people. And suddenly it's like the U S is not, not necessarily anti-conflict or we're not going to want to get involved. Then NATO loses a lot of its teeth. So I think this is some very calculated statements and this idea that they're pushing. And I think they know it and they're not trying to necessarily, I think, convince the world about this, that there's Nazis there. I think they're just trying to get enough people to believe it just enough. Yes. No, and you bring up a really good point. This article was written in Russian in a Nush, in a Russian news outlet. Like its intended audience was not English speaking or, you know, Western speaking Europe and United States. So their the goal here is to mobilize their own people and they're counting on their own people's ignorance uh, for it to be a compelling argument. I was thinking about it's interesting that they're saying that Sergei Sev here is trying to convince his own people that Ukrainian nationalism is a larger threat to the world and to Russia than uh, Hitler's, uh, you know, Nazism in Germany. The irony here is that what did Russia do when Adolf Hitler uh, was about to kick off World War Three? Like oh, this big threat, right? Like, World War oh II. no, we've they, they kicked hey, off World War Two. Yeah, <laughs> he said World War Two. What I say, he World said World War Three. <laughs> we're we're on the but, we're on the doorstep. Well, of World that's War III. yeah. <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What did what did Russia do when Adolf Hitler was about to kick off World War Two? They, they signed an agreement. They're like, oh, they well, freaking let's be made a pact with him. <laughs> let's be friends. Let's let's share technology. Let's let's partition Poland again. Like. Yay! Like, are you freaking serious? The, and then, like, th- so they made a pact with them, and it was only because they were betrayed, betrayed, which completely surprised Stalin, by the way. Uh, and we have every reason to believe that Stalin's confidence that Germany would invade uh, was in large part due to his personal trust in Adolf Hitler. <laughs> like, holy crap. So it's like, okay. If you guys thought that they were a big of a threat to the world, why'd you freaking get on the same side with them? Uh, and secondly, like you didn't, not only did you uh, make a pact with them, like they didn't invade, they didn't attack, which is exactly what they're doing now. Like they're, they're invading a country that couldn't invade Russia, even if it wanted to. So yeah. the, like, it's mind blowing how historically absent minded this is. Uh, and it's a shame that people in Russia, that there's a lot of people in Russia who believe this. Now, I I've, don't think everyone in Russia believes this, but go ahead. I was going to say, so you, you said something very key there. They're essentially trying to convince the Russian people that there is a threat to the world, not just Russia or Europe, but the world. And, you know, that kind of harkens back to the Russian identity that for many years, they have seen themselves as the saviors of Europe. So, I mean, it started with the Mongol invasions. They were the ones that really started to defeat the Mongols and start pushing them back and reclaiming, you know, they, they absorbed a lot of losses against the Mongols for, and they were under the yoke for 200 years and they eventually started pushing them back from the gates of Europe. Then with Napoleon and Napoleon's invasion of Russia in the winter, it's famous now, we know it. He was unstoppable up until that point. They defeated Napoleon again with Hitler. Hitler was, I mean, he had Russia on its knees and they lost millions of people, but eventually the Russians won and they, in large part, were the reason that the Allies won World War II. So they are taking, I think they're, the Russian meat, you know, the, the state media, the state messaging is, we need to kind of twist this and to fit that narrative that we that we hold as part of our identity. 
that we've talked about before. So, you know, that is very important. And obviously that messaging is going to filter out into the rest of the world as well. Real quickly, I also want to talk about why Russia chose to respond with a, with a military invasion. And I think it'll be helpful for our listeners to kind of compare and contrast Russian history with American and Chinese history, just for, uh, just for comparison. The, Russia's entire history, all going back all the way to the Muscovites, is, oh, you're a threat to me. We're going to go to war, and then I'm just going to take over your territory. And that happened <laughs> over and over and over and over. It was throwing off the, the, the Mongol yoke, right, and fighting off the Golden Horde, fighting off the Korean Khanate, fighting off the, the Kazan people, a, a one common mis, uh, misconception about how Russia became so large, right, is that, oh, Siberia, it's this uninhabited wasteland. We're just going to, like, colonize it and eventually peacefully occupy all the way to, oh, you know, Vladivostok. Like, that's not how that went down. Like, they slaughtered their way through. There were the Uzbeks, uh, or the Uzbeks, uh, mm-hmm. the uh Tajiks uh, a little bit further south. There were the Siberians, which were a people. Uh, there's the uh, I already mentioned the uh, the country of Kazan. Like uh, that, I don't know how to say this. The Nogiai, Nugai, N O G I A. Listeners, please correct me on my horrible pronunciation this episode. <laughs> but like these were other countries. These are other people, and the Russians were just like, "No, your freaking your land belongs to us now," and they colonized, they conquered all the way to the Pacific Ocean. They fought off the Mongols, they fought off the Han Chinese and the the Ming and later Qing empires. Like they conquered their way all the way to the Pacific. And actually, they didn't. They didn't actually stop at Vladivostok. Uh, little known tidbit: they actually owned part Alaska and parts of the. Um, I guess it would be, you know, very Western Canada. So they, they actually own parts of North America and um, yeah. we bought Alaska from the Russians. So they right. had a lot of territory, a lot. Yeah. And it wasn't like simple colonization. It mm-hmm. was, it was very similar. And this is where it comes into contrast. It was very, so American history is similar, but different. When you look at how the United States expanded in continental North America, it was similar. Like we were making these treaties and agreements with Indians, but then when things went south, you know, there was war and we annexed their territory. Like we followed a very similar model in our westward expansion. And we came up with all kinds of ways to justify that. And and I don't want to make this episode about the ethics of those of that westward expansion. I just simply want to note that there is a similarity between when you when you push out, it's not like you're occupying empty space. unoccupied lands. Yeah, there's people there, and it, and in the same way that that was true for the United States, the exact same was true for when Russia expanded. The difference in American history is that once we had occupied that that territorial bound, you know, of once manifest destiny, so to speak, was complete, the there are very very few examples of us, you know doing British style, French style, uh, Belgian style, colonial imperialism. Uh, the Philippines is probably in Hawaii to a certain extent, uh, is the only real examples of that in American history. Whereas that defines Russian history. They didn't like, it's not like they achieved a boundary and stopped. Like they just kept going because there is no good boundary. They don't have the same, like, nice neat little lines that are only you know like us where we're bordered by two countries they don't have that equivalent they just kept going and they go and they go there is no Mm -hmm. stopping it conversely for chinese history china is like a category completely unto its own where they have this middle kingdom concept it's they don't have like this imperialist idea in the same way of western colonial expansion they have this idea of like here's the emperor he has the mandate of heaven, you should pay him tribute and, uh, you know, perform the kowtow. That's it. You can keep your lands, you can keep your kingdoms, blah, blah, blah. 
uh, Henry Kissinger's book on China is, is really um, good for understanding. China expanded I'm, I'm because it absorbed its conquerors. Go ahead. I was going to say, I'm glad you mentioned that book. I was sitting there like, oh, he, he, he should mention On China by, by Kissinger. Because, yeah, that, that really talks about it. they have a fundamental difference of how they want to go about things than, than we do. Right. So, like, now we're, we're generalizing three different countries, you know, thousands of years of history talking about China. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make here is that when Russia encounters a problem, their solution is to invade. That is a uniquely Russian thing that doesn't, that well, they it's invade, definitely not true for the majority of other and countries. Occupy. They invade, occupy, annex, and now it's part yes. of, you know, it is Russia. You know, China and the U.S., we do, we have invaded countries before, but typically, you know, at least in our recent history, it's like, okay, well, we're going to do the Marshall Plan. And, you know, we may have some forces here, but it, we're going we're gonna to turn it back over. Same with the Chinese. Um, they'll infl- they have an area of influence, but they're, they're not going to make this. This is China now. This is America now. Whereas Russia, like you said, it is right. Russian now. Yeah. The, our war against Mexico and the Spanish-American War are really the only two times where we have ever like fought a war against another nation state and then permanently kept their territory. Oh, by the way, those two wars took place pre-World War I and in relative close proximity to one another chronologically. And we never did it again. It's the exception. It's not the rule. Again, I'm not trying to justify, you know, the, those two conflicts. I'm just simply trying to state like, It would be grossly misleading to try to equivocate American history with Russian history by saying, Mm -hmm. well, you Americans did it too. Like, yes, we did. But again, that was the exception, not the rule. Whereas it is a defining characteristic of Russian history. Mm -hmm. So we should not be shocked. Like, it's not, I say all that to say, like, when, when we see troops, when Russia puts troops on a country's border, we're we're cuckoo for cocoa puffs to say oh they're just they're just protecting their their national interests like no they're looking to conquer and annex that's what they do <laughs> it's not well, like americans showing up in saudi arabia and kuwait it's not the same thing well yeah you know they'll say they're protecting the national interest so Yes, I, I'm sure. Yeah, there's probably a better way to phrase that. They're not protecting their national interest in the same way that we would, mm-hmm. right? Their their version of protecting their national interest is this is all Mother Russia now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Whereas we, you know, we leave eventually. Uh, except, you know, we might leave some military bases here and there. But that's another episode. <laughs> or, a bu- or a bunch of stuff just sitting in the desert. Who knows? Yeah. Um, hey, another, the, the last point that I wanted to make on why a special military operation is uh, the correlation between poisonings and how they treat their brothers in the Ukraine. Mm-hmm. The uh, targeted killings or assass- political assassinations performed by the Russian government is nearly always, uh, again, there's exceptions, but nearly always uh, against Russian citizens who, in in Putin's view, view, have betrayed their country. You know, during the height of the Cold War in Berlin, when uh, the Soviets captured an American or a Western spy, they didn't execute him on the spot. It was It was a game. It was, hey, we caught you, and... You know, there's this famous bridge of spies in Berlin where we would do prisoner exchanges where we caught each other's spies and we'd turn them back over. They expect the West in the United States to, to subvert them. But there is no tolerance for it, Russians uh, for doing the same thing. And they will kill them. Uh, I think that's another reason why for the Ukraine here, they do consider... Ukraine, Russia. And even though there's a quite a bit of self-deception going on in terms of Ukraine's not a real thing, uh, 
at a minimum, they have a they have a common origin in a similar language uh, when it comes to ethnic identity. Therefore, uh, you know, you burn heretics at the stake. You don't burn, you know, if you're a Catholic um, in the in the Inquisition, the Inquisition was not aimed for, uh, uh, you know, Islamic uh, scholars. It was aimed for heretics, right? Heretics get burned at the state. The people that you're most closely aligned to but wrong are the ones that you tend to hate the most. You yes. know what I mean? And I, I think that's part of human nature to uh, to take more seriously and maybe get more angered by the family betraying you as opposed to your enemy betraying you. And you, I think that's another reason why they're responding the way that they are in Ukraine. You expect that you expect your enemy to attack you to, yeah, like you said, subvert you, you know, with the Ukrainians, right. I think in that, that article, they talk about, they literally, you know, say re-education, uh, hit, Russia has a history of uh, gulags and re-education camps. I think they're going to, um, you know, once the war, I don't think they're trying to inflict mass con- casualties in this conflict, similar to, you know, they're not going to go and firebomb Kiev or, you know, just try and level it and kill as many people as possible and bring it to its knees. I think they're going to try and take it over, leave as many people alive. And then I think the re-education begins. And then that's like where you said that the people who are involved with this pro-NATO, pro-EU um split and you know political movement are going to be you know as you said to you know quote burn at the stake they're going to be the heretics whereas the people are going to see and they're going to use that you know show the people of your russia this is what happens when you mess with us um and you're going to be brought to heel you're going to be brought back into the fold as a russian not a ukrainian because ukrainians are nazis according to the russians okay so moving on to our, our third and final point here you know we've discussed you know, Russia believes, <clears throat> or its main cause of eye is the denazification of Ukraine. It's going to, it's the method by which it will denazify Ukraine is to invade them by doing the special military operation, annexing its territories, breaking apart their country, etc. But there's also a very strong anti-Western element to this war. It's not merely anti-Ukraine. It is anti-Western. Because they view, in that first paragraph that I read, uh, they view Ukraine as an instrument of the West. So check this out. This is, this is Sergei Sev in the, in the article. Unlike Georgia and the Baltic countries, Ukraine, as history has shown, is impossible as a nation state and attempts to build... Uh, sorry, and attempts to build one naturally has led to Nazism. Ukraine uh, is an artificial anti-Russian construct that does not have its own civilizational content, a subordinate element of a foreign and alien civilization. Debanderization by itself will not be enough for denazification. The Bandera element is only a performer and a stage screen, a disguise for you, for the European project of a Nazi Ukraine, therefore, the denazification of Ukraine is also its inevitable de-Europeanization. So, in that paragraph, he draws a direct connection between we can't get rid of Nazism in the Ukraine if we don't get rid of the Europeanization. Mm-hmm. Of the Ukraine, of the of the, of Ukraine. So the que- you know the question I have for you, Colin, is how do you see this conflict playing out in the future, or why do you think the Russian government uh, is so anti-Western as well in this conflict? <laughs> it's 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 such a weird. Um, it's like conflicting ideas that they're holding at the same time. You know they're de-Europeanization, but at the same time, they kind of see themselves as the saviors of Europe and that's wrapped in their identity. And we've talked about that quite a bit. Um, I think when they say de-Europeanization, they mean um, anti-Belgium, meaning anti-EU, anti-NATO. I see this playing out 
And, you know, in a historical context, I think we talked about this last episode, the Russians have always had a chip on their shoulder. I think Eastern Europeans in general have always had a chip on their shoulder against Western Europe. Um, They've always been viewed as backwards by the West. You know, they were always behind. They were, you know, serfdom was a thing in Russia in the 19th century, and that was banned in Western Europe. So they've always been behind the times. And I think they still have a chip on their shoulder from that. It's, It's a long history. So... It, it, I don't know. I just, I know it was kind of a tangent, but I, I just find that weird that they say de-Europeanization when they very clearly are European. Anyway, you know, the the question of how this conflict is going to play out, I think warfare, it, the, this conflict is now at an international level and it's being fought not necessarily through military arms. It's also economics. I mean, the Ukraine now, was you know it's known as the breadbasket of Europe. It is now um, no longer able to export grain, and there's been a lot of uh, chatter about this on Twitter and social media and some of the news about um, you know the prices of wheat are going up. They are not able to export food, and I think um, Putin knows this. And food's a big deal, and if when you start having hungry people, um, that destabilizes entire regions. And Ukraine exports food. Um, pretty heavily into NATO influenced areas, um, you know, Africa and the Middle East. And it's like suddenly if they lose their food supply, those areas which are hotbeds for all sorts of anti-Western, anti-European sentiment become destabilized, conflict can arise. And that is, I think he's playing that up, you know, and then on the other side, you have energy, the energy crisis, um, you know, I think in the summer, it's not going to be as big of a deal, but you know, when winter comes around again and, you know, Western Europe can't heat their homes. Um, that's going to cause a lot of um, angry people. And, you know, think about it. If you're living in Northern Germany and you're freezing in the middle of winter because you can't turn the power on or you know, energy prices have quadrupled or something like that, you're going to be less likely to oppose Putin if he can, you know, turn the gas back on and you can heat your home. So I think warfare is being fought on different levels now. And I think he's engaged economically. And I think that we're going to see some serious um, issues in the global economy. We've, we're already seeing it in the supply chain from COVID. I think this is going to exacerbate a lot of those um, those issues. So I see that, that occurring at a, at a much greater scale over the coming months than say like a, a traditional conflict between East and West over the plains of Northern Europe, something like that, that we feared in the Cold War. What do you think? Yeah. Yes, but particularly with the withholding grain, burning grain, attacking food silos, etc. It almost feels like this petty child uh, that's saying like, I'm just going to like kick your shin, not because I think it's going to change your mind, but because it'll make me feel better type deal. Like the United States isn't going to starve. No, uh, he- London, uh, Paris, Berlin, you know, these, these countries, Tokyo, we're not going to starve. It's the countries like Africa or, or countries in Africa. Like you said, if food, yeah, food shortage, is not an asymm or it's not a symmetric, um, uh, shortage that's going to happen. So it's not going to, you know, countries that are, are fairly wealthy, i.e. the West, you know, America, you know, London, things like, you know, they'll be able to, to, insulate themselves somewhat from, you know, increased food prices and fertilizer prices. You know, that's another one. Fertilizer, it's, you want to grow your food, you need fertilizer. So, you know, like the U.S., we have the most contiguous arable land um, in the world. So like, we're not going to starve. We have enough food. We have enough um, to withstand it. We have enough wealth. So does a lot of Europe, but other countries that are very poor, they aren't going to have money to buy food and they're not going to be able to produce food on their own they're going to starve and it's going to be very bad and you know i don't necessarily think it's a you know a petulant child i think it is a a calculated move that he said this is i can't beat through strength of arms the united states it's just not going to happen I, i can't do it but i know that the global economy relies on a lot of moving parts all over the world and if i throw a wrench somewhere in this global economy or a couple wrenches and a couple well-placed little bombs that go off, I can cause chaos. And in that chaos, I can achieve my goals. 
I think that's really what the move was when it comes to some of these economic policies. Yeah. It's like a hostage situation. It's like, <laughs> hey, I know I can't overpower you, but I'm going to hold hostage this, mm-hmm. you know, this entity that can't fight me. And I'm going to point the gun at their head to try to manipulate you to stop what you're doing. You know and what I mean? It's this thing that you hold very like, valuable. Right. And I just can't help but think like, I, I, I do think there's an element of childishness to it because in, in the sense that this, I don't think that this was a pre-planned activity. I think this is Russia getting desperate because the, they're not doing themselves any favor by causing other countries to starve. You know, Russia cares a lot about Africa. They, you know, private military companies hang out in there all the time. They're trying to expand their influence there. If they cause famine mm-hmm. over there, that's not going to do them any favors. Like this, this whole thing is like, you know, trying to starve all these countries. It's not uh, advancing the Russian cause in the world. It's making Russia look like the evil monsters that, and that that's, I, if they, if they did think that through, they're freaking in a, in a new world of self delusion. Uh, aside from food shortages, the, the main reason why I wanted to bring this out is I remember Tucker Carlson at the, uh, before February, uh, had a, had a few pieces on trying to say that we should not be worried about Russia. The real enemy is China and Russia's just trying to protect their national interest type deal. And aside from a whole bunch of other problems that I have with uh, what Carlson was trying to argue, the fundamental thing that those statements ignore is that Russia doesn't view us the same way. Russia does not look at us and go, hey, guys, we really this isn't against you. We just want our territory back. We want the Nazis in the Ukraine gone. Can we please play nice and let us do this? That's not what they're saying. They're saying our ultimate project is actually to be counter to Europe in the United States. They're the real enemy here. And we're going to do that by removing a tool from their toolbox, i.e. Ukraine, that we believe, you know, Vladimir Putin is real big on talking about color revolutions, particularly the orange revolution, uh, blames the West and like particularly Western non-government organizations or NGOs. Him and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. And it's like I, we're fooling ourselves if we think that there can be long term uh, co- or not coexistence, but long term uh um, I, I don't know what the word I'm looking for and, and I don't want to say the wrong thing, but like Vladimir Putin's policy is not to be mutually beneficial with the West. It is to take advantage of and to ultimately defeat the West. And this special military operation or war in the Ukraine is just one more example of that because, and again, this is to their own people here, this article, uh, was to their own people. It they're trying to mobilize their own population to be anti-Western, anti-European, anti-American. Like that has generational effects. I'm going to agree with some of what you said, but disagree with and so I agree with you that Russia's goal is to be counter to the US, and that's not a good thing, but I do agree with Tucker when he said that China is more of a threat or it is the greater threat. I, I absolutely think that, you know, Russia, at the end of the day, we we can exist. They'll, we'll just be counter to each other. You know, the U.S. doesn't need Russia to survive. We don't. We can, They can be an enemy and they can be completely cut off. It's not going to affect us. We have oil. We have food. We can supply we can take their place. Honestly, we could, we could sink their economy if we just started doing some of the things that they do, because we could do it better. Um, whereas China, I think wants to, so that you said Russia's goal is to be counter to the U S and the West. I think China's goal is to supplant the U S as the global hegemon. Um, you know, they want to, they want to be the power and, you know, the U S be under, you know, underneath them. So it's, um, 
it's a very, um, I don't know. It's, it's, I agree with him there in that I think they're the greater threat. I think the U S really needs to be cognizant of the influence that Russia is going to have over countries like India, um, Pakistan. Um, you know, obviously there's Iran and North Korea. Those are the ones we always see, but you know, I think India as well, um, you know, they're a, an Asian country with 1.3, almost 1.4 billion people. Um, there were a lot of reports during this conflict about India buying oil directly from um, Russia. And I just feel like that is something that's an ally that is in the you know Asian continent that we cannot afford to lose. Um, so I could see that with Russia being this counter state to the U S they begin to influence with their natural resources and take away, um, you know, they use their natural resources as a means to gain influence on some of these other countries that we would really need, um, you know, on our side, like India. So, I mean, I, I do think there's, there's validity to what you're saying in the sense of it's not like Russia is not going to stop until the continental United States is now a part of the Russian empire. I, I don't think Can't that, happen. That, that that's in the goal. I, I don't even think that like, you know, real hardcore Russian dreams of like owning all of continental Europe, like all the way to, Paris, Paris, uh, it, you know, making that belong to Russia. I don't think that's the goal either. But, um, oh, one last thing. You know, Putin, Putin himself has kind of discussed one of his major uh, gripes with the West is not being treated as an equal, mm-hmm. which does, which does make one think that. Uh, oh, e- equality of respect is really what he's after here. I'm not saying I agree with that full blown, but I do think there's there's an argument to be made with for what you're saying. I also agree that China's in state is not necessarily about territorial expansion reference, you know, what we were saying earlier, but they do seek to supplant the United States as as not just simply a regional uh, hegemon, they want to be they you know they want to expand that mandate of heaven over as as much many peoples as possible. So where does that leave us? Yeah, I, honestly, the and and what I think it's of course one of the recurring themes that we're going to discuss over and over again is that. History is nuanced, right? Mm-hmm. And the nuances is, okay, they might not be wanting to take over Paris, but if we think that there's, that they're just going to, that we're ever going to diplomatically get them, them specifically being Vladimir Putin to diplomatically withdraw from the Crimea, like, or from the, the Donbass or the areas that they've already conquered, we're crazy. They're not going to do that. They will be, as hardcore confrontational to us uh, as possible in order to retain those territories. And it's no different than China getting very upset about uh, Taiwan. They see that as their land. And as long as we don't acquiesce to that, there will be conflict between our, our cultures. Right. Exactly. And I mean, I think, uh, you know, Russia's already gained like something like 80% of the Donbass region at this point, the industrial heartland of Ukraine. So, um, you know, they're not going to give that up. They've gained that. That is critical. That is, they're not going to give it up to your point. And I don't think the economic sanctions are going to cause them to give it up either. I the, think the ruble's back to what it's, it's pre-war level. One of the announcements that I saw on NPR was that they were, um, Russia was going to cut rates uh, because back to pre-war levels because the ruble was doing fine. Inflation was under control. I, I feel like they, at least from a government standpoint, Russia thinks that their economy is okay. They've weathered most of the storm and they have a plan moving forward. As a matter of fact, I think I saw that they just cut um, natural gas to Italy. 
um, yeah. just unexpectedly. So in Germany um, and Germany. Oh, wow. Okay. So in Germany, so they're, they're very, they're, I think they are prepared, prepared to utilize their natural resources um, as an absolute weapon. And they feel confident in their economy that they can handle it. Yeah. <laughs> I think sanctions, there's a certain, uh, there's a certain level of mirror imaging going on in mm-hmm. that, you know, the West kind of views if you want to really like twist the West's ear, you affect our economies. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we mirror image that. And we believe that, you know, these countries like Iran, North Korea, Russia, to a much lesser extent, China, uh, you know, we slap all these sanctions on them and we expect there to be diplomatic results. And I'm sure from time to time there are, minor uh or even major gains on the on the foreign policy side of the house but again like north korea uh has been a horrible place to live in their economy is ridiculously bad and yet uh you know they're still firing missiles off left and right like they well, we, they're still we pursuing should- their we spent the whole last episode talking about the Russians taking pride in this and them having an identity. Yeah. It's like, it's not even phasing them. Um, right. I think that's the mistake that we make is viewing them as Westerners as, okay, what works on the U S I mean, look around and, and, you know, to the listeners, we're going to have plenty of series on our, on economics and political parties, but look right now in the United States, how the economy is affecting the political landscape right now. That's not really happening over there. That is not happening in Russia, at least as far as we can tell. Um, and most of the intelligence community and, and the news cycle, it, it's not having that same effect. It, it, it didn't. Um, they are just a fundamentally different kind of people. And we should accept that. All right, everybody, just to summarize uh, what we've discussed, uh, we've talked about uh, why uh, Russia views... Uh, the Ukraine as a bunch of Nazis, uh, if there's any validity to that and, and what the response should be. Uh, we've discussed why the Russians, uh, specifically Vladimir Putin has decided to launch what he calls a special military operation. Uh, what the rest of the world is calling a war in, (laughs) uh, in the Ukraine, uh, and why that's their response to, uh, to, or their uh, their method to denazify the Ukraine. And finally, we discussed uh, uh, the implications for Western Russian relations. How how is how is a conflict in the Ukraine affecting how Russia views the West, how the West should view Russia uh, and, and what the way forward is. Uh, Colin and I are very excited about our next and final episode in the Russia-Ukraine series, and we're going to discuss a history of information warfare, specifically looking at uh, a lot of the great examples in the early, in the initial phases back in February and March of the current Russia-Ukraine conflict, uh, and how the internet was utilized, how fake news was utilized, uh, how manipulation of data, et cetera, was used to kind of, uh, uh, or how it was leveraged in this conflict. So Absolutely we'll talk about that. We'll highlight the ghost of Kiev. Ghost of Kiev yes. can play a big role. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The intro song should be like the danger zone. <laughs> to the play the play the clip zone. of the video games that are. Yeah, exactly. This is, it's going to be a good have episode. like the ghost of Kiev flying around. <laughs> exactly. It's going to be a good episode because I, I was following this conflict on Twitter. It's amazing. You're following it on Twitter and it's just so much stuff is coming out and fake, real, you don't know. It's going to be a good episode. So uh, thanks again for our listeners. We hope you all enjoyed this. Feel free to give us any feedback on the website or uh, in the, in the comments uh, down below. So really appreciate it. And we'll see you next time on the loins of history. Thank you.